A very good morning to you all. Hope you are having uh, a pleasant coffee because it's raining and chill out here. I'm sure it's the same for you throughout the island. Uh, we have here the PG Diploma team. We teach systems, of, uh, systems analysis and uh, some of the lecturers are here. Our chief is here to cheerlead us. Uh, we are here to showcase a very simple use case that walks you through the upgraded curriculum that we are launching, or we have been revising it quite some time. It's been a year plus now. I'm sure many alumni are watching, so uh, a good hi to all of you. And this session is done by three of us. It's me, Surya, we have, uh, followed by Tin, who is going to introduce functional programming to you, and then followed by Cherwa, who is our mobile Android and machine learning expert. So my job is to talk about Spring programming and how the reactive framework works on a Spring programming environment. So welcome to the talk and let's get started. So um, as I mentioned, we're going to cut the topics into four pieces. Okay? So one, one is the Spring reactive. The second is the functional programming for uh, Java streams. The third is the online part of the gaming engine. And the last part is machine learning. Okay. So we may not be um, showing you the very fancy stuff, which is the augmented reality, virtual reality on the front kernel, which is Unity. But we are going to talk about engineering all the interesting, intelligent, smart things that happen behind the screen. So we hope you enjoy this and uh, feel free to ask us questions. And I'm going to start my part of the talk, which is Spring Reactive. Spring Reactive is a very new framework and it has been out for uh, a couple of uh, months now. The boot framework is currently on the two plus version and boot framework is something like a wrapper. It's a meta model and uh, it actually wraps any kind of very specific microservices, cloud services, data services, and so on and so forth. The best part about Spring Boot is it works very seamlessly with other ja JavaScript systems as well as .NET systems. Sounds cool. Huh? So that's why we chose that. So what is reactive programming? If I have to give you a very simple introduction, uh, a one-liner per se, because I always like one-liners. You remember that longer than a lot of paragraphs that we speak, right? It's all about asynchronous data stream programming. You do everything around asynchronous data stream. So what is this asynchronous data stream? So it is a continuous flow of data as opposed to your classical web where you put in a request and you get a response back. So you're trying to have a whole new set of programming model around this new technique, which handles continuous moving data that comes in different speed, that comes from different channels and devices, that comes from more concurrent users that are growing on the internet. If you have a client facing application, which most of the cloud gaming engines are, then here, here we go for the meta model, which talks about collecting all these reactive uh, streams and having an integrated framework to process it. So what will be the ideal characteristics? They're supposed to be flexible. They're supposed to be fault tolerant. The most important part, they have to scale at will. Okay? So this kind of elasticity is what we are looking at from frameworks such as Spring Reactive in building a reactive system. So with that very simple one-liner introduction, let me move on to why is it so important? You know, Where do you apply? That's a very silly question given this day's context because you can apply it anywhere. You play, play games in any device. You use any number of sensors to be interacting with your gaming engine. And you also have a lot of additional add-ons that you put onto your gaming engine. So reactive, not necessarily in the gaming use cases, but in many other um, B2C situations is found to be very, very interesting paradigm of programming. For example, you're continuously trying to do a lot of uh, application transactions using smaller devices. You know, they only keep growing. We have a lot of new behavior on the internet like digital purchases, usage patterns, consumption patterns. Those are also generating continuous data, which we call it as moving data. And not forgetting to mention the very key explosion of devices in form of IoT. These days in the research, the folks call it as IOE, Internet of Everything. So even your watches are speaking to you, your simple uh, glasses are speaking to you, your home appliances are speaking to you. So there's always continuous moving data that is coming towards uh, your system and reactive system has to take in care 
of all these factors when they develop uh, something on the set. So do we directly deep dive into technology? Is there no other uh, design thinking or uh, aspects of how the user experience come in? That's a great chapter, right? We have another expert who always deals with all the details of this. She's very good, the team, she leads the team, which is Esther, and her team is very good in explaining all the scenarios and how do you develop UI environment. To put it in a nutshell, you have to start thinking about personas in terms of a gaming engine, right? So when you're building an engine, you know avatars, you know personas. So there are a lot of things that you have to think through in the terms of design thinking. It starts from identifying what are the common elements to going into the pain points that's going to be very difficult to look at. And then you have to make sure that you have strategies as fallback to manage all these pain points. And then of course, she also uh, manages to teach you how to find out influencers. That's a great skill. So there's a lot of interesting design thinking happening. And that's the first thing that we take a step when we want to design something, including the use case that we are discussing here, which is the gaming engine. Brilliant, right? And then we go into the technical part of it, which is where the spring comes in. So once you've in, understood what you want on the front screen of the application, how you want the sensors to interact with you, what are the different kinds of channels you're going to pick in for uh, designing this gaming engine, the next talk is about the conversation part. So how is my conversation between the gaming engine going to happen? So you have to classify things that has to happen synchronously and the thing that happen, things that happen asynchronously, which I was just defining as reactive data streams. So it is important for you to identify which of these non-blocking IOs are being bunched in, and this has to be taken in. There can be a lot of things that you do with these things. It could be simple, simple computation, you know, suppose you have a, a gaming person moving a sword, you have to calculate your force torque and the speed at which you hit the enemy. There are so many things that are computational. There are so many things that you want to remember, the arms that he has chosen, the emanations that he has, his preference, his character, his style, all these things have to be mem in memory. Sometimes in memory as a file or sometimes in persistent store where you can access them a little slower. So all these things have to be identified and that's the idea behind non-blocking IO. Particularly this event streams. Okay? So what do you do with this event stream is you find out who all are emitting data. What are the different data points that are coming in? How do I collect them? We simply call them as events, messages, whatever is the preferred way of strategy and framework that we are going to involve in. How these things get processed and then how the server is going to push back the replies that come from it. We have a very beautiful term to explain this. We call this back pressure. It basically comes from fluid mechanics. Don't you think it is very interesting to see how your blood flows and there is a little black back pressure created by different organs of your body to the heart and the heart always deals with back pressure. So that was the influence for naming these kind of frameworks as uh, back pressure frameworks. To give you more examples, there are plenty of back pressure and callback frameworks that we have on the client side hosting. There is no restrictions. We no longer think in terms of channel of delivery. We don't classify web applications, mobile applications anymore. We just say edge computing. Okay? And we are trying to cover plenty of devices on the client side hosting. This could deal with browsers. This could deal with smaller and bigger devices like tablets and PCs. It could be small devices like your smartphones, IOTs, plenty of sensors. Anything could be interacting with your system and you want to package the interaction via a client side app, which we usually use different popular frameworks that we have discussed. You know, it could be Angular, it could be React. These days it could be simply done on Rust and TypeScript. So we have uh, Go front end. So we have too many very good choices on that particular plate. So this is my own invention of diagram. So it is there to convey what are the different functionalities are, that are being enclosed and the different kind of uh, uh, technical framework that you've got to choose for each of these functionalities. And don't sue me, it's just for understanding. Right? And then you've got to classify your communication channels. You've got to classify them as blocking and non-blocking. Then of course you have to design the server side, which is where the reactive part happens in a, in a scalable manner. I've given you one single example here. So for instance, if you choose one of your client to be an Angular client, which is a popular choice, you decide that you have to have a client that generates the data stream. Okay? So this is the client side end of the asynchronous data streaming part. 
There are many libraries that are, pro that are probably used. We have Akka, we have uh, 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 RxJS, we have RxJava. In this example, I have picked up RxJS because uh, we want to show that Spring Boot is sort of inclusive of all the different programming languages. Programming languages are no longer key choices. You know? On the server side, we use technologies like Flux, uh, Data, Cloud, and so on and so forth, and put them into the data store. To uh, dive more into what is being addressed, uh, we, we take a, two different stacks. One is the traditional classic stack, which works on the servlet, and the other one is the reactive stack, which works on streams. And we use different kind of messaging. We use different kind of uh, reactive servers to be able to understand data coming in from both the client side as well as the server side. A lot of technical details that we dive in and students get to practice plenty of these examples using workshops, case studies. We also ask them to provide simple uh, built uh, prototypes and uh, continuous assessment projects. So enough talking, I got to show you how something works, right? So we have a video that plays for a two minutes plus that shows you how to develop a simple gaming part server side end to end. Folks, this is a very quick demo of the tic-tac-toe game done reactor style. So you can see that the main players in this are the moves, um, the player and the game. The game tracks the player as well as the game status. And of course, the rest of the attributes are just designed appropriately to keep it simple. Every of these entity classes are coded and used um, uh, appropriately by the proper REST controllers and REST repositories. The main controller is wired with a few services that's going to come and help in the game playing, like game service player and the session management. The game logic codes all the winning moves. And to make it interesting, I have made sure that I always win. And purposely, the computer makes very blur moves. There is perks in being a developer, you see. <laughs> then we have the security configuration, intercepts all the roles and authentication procedures. I created some simple data sets to test the system with my name and my friend's name. On the client side, we basically have an Angular app, uh, which is trying to uh, talk to all the API endpoints in the React. Uh, mode and of course uh, we are trying to run this code inside the node.js uh, engine um, to get the application started i got to run the engine and then start the node.js as well so i basically set everything up so that we can quickly push ourselves to see the demo okay. so uh, let me open up any browser here and to look forward to how to play the game so i got to look for my local host colon 8080 to start playing the game and uh, I'm going to use my name to start the play. Okay. So I've already played some to test it before this demo session. So this time I want to play with the computer. So I'm going to say, let me just start playing the game. Okay. So I make my moves. The computer makes it moves. As I said, um, I tweaked it so that I can always win. And not fair, right? So I got to compete with my friends to prove that uh, I got some skills on the game. So if I want to play the same game, uh, with my friends around, what I can do is I can start using um, a competition mode and then pick what I want to use as play. And then, of course, I make my moves. Okay? So I got to wait for the other person to join and uh, uh, use the game. So you can see that um, I can log out and then show you how it looks on the other player's uh, board. Okay? So when uh, Tin comes, he logs in today happily and he... Uh, looks at the game so he knows that I've started a game and he wants to participate he can load the game and then go ahead and make his moves okay? thank you very much for watching it's a very simplified uh, reactor framework working from end to end that uh, completes a small piece that I want to show you as uh, an end-to-end -end demonstration of course my team has more interesting insights uh, uh, to explain how you can do the nuances of the gaming engine part and uh, uh, as a conclusion, I would like to say Reactive is going to stay here. It's going to be a very practical technique for many new styles of architecture that is coming in every day. We talk about email management streams and Reactive streams. It is enabled on different protocols. Okay. So uh, Spring Reactor that I'm trying to promote today is a very simple published subscribe architecture, which works in terms of Rx Java, and it gives you mono and flux uh, classes to be able to do this kind of asynchronous communication. Thank you, and leave the, I'll leave the floor with Tim uh, to talk about the next topic, functional programming. Here I'm talking about a new 
ways of programming. This is functional programming with the demonstration using the Java stream. Okay, so let's get started with a simple problem. Let's say that we have a list of uh, game plays and we try to compute the average score of uh, a player. For example, here I have a Java class called gameplay. So which player and what is the score that is score and when he played it. And each of the player, there is an ID and username. So we try to compute the average score of this player, right? So for example, in our data, we have three player and the player one has uh, three games. The first one, she has a city score. The second one, she scored 50. And the last one, she scored 70. So average, she scored 60. So how we can compute that, right? Uh, usually, we are programmer. We use this common, uh, it's also called imperative approach, which is that. So our first step is that we start with look through the given list. And after that, we try to filter all of the object of the player one, right? And then we compute the score together. We add the score together and we see that how many times that he's played. And finally, we return the average. So this is the implementation in Java. You can see that we keep uh, two variable, total and times. And in the uh, first step, we have a for loop. In the second one, we have the if else statement. And after that, in the third one, we compute the total, the time, and after that, we return the average. Of course, the uh, output for this one is a 60 score. So, so far, so good, right? But the thing is that we always ask ourselves that, is there anything that we can improve? And let's say that, is there any problem with this imperative approach? The first problem we noticed is that we use the mutable variable. For example, total and time. Whenever we use a mutable variable, it's easy to create error. The second one is that, for example, now uh, not three player, but one million players, and we have a lot of record. We want to make use of parallelism. Supporting parallelism is not that easy in our imperative approach. And finally, uh, our code can be more concise. This one I can uh, tell you later, okay? So uh, the, the topic about mutable variable is uh, complex, so there's a link for, uh, for you to uh, move on. Okay, so now we introduce the new style of programming, right? This is functional programming and how this one uh, can improve the situation. First of all, Functional programming is a style of programming. And the key thing is that it focuses on what we are programming, right? We let the computer say that what we need to do and not how we, need, we want to do that. So the key thing is that what we want the computer to do and not specify how to do that. So in functional programming, uh, it treats the computation as just a series of functions. So uh, let's uh, have a demonstration with Java. In Java, functional programming is done through Java stream, right? So a stream is a sequence of elements on which we perform the task. So what is it? Uh, again, right, because functional programming, in here we specify what needs to be done and we don't specify how to do. We let Java stream to deal with how to do that. So let's, uh, let's have a very simple example here. In this line, right, you see that this one, we compute the sum of all the even number inside an array. And you see that this one is the way that we do in functional programming. There are three functions over there. The first one is the off. The off one, create a stream from an array. The second one is a filter. So we try to filter all the even number. And finally, we sum all of them together. Again, right, you see here that we specify what we need to do and not how we do it. 
so let's uh, get more thing about this uh, Java stream. So in Java stream, the key thing is about the stream pipeline, all right? So we always start with a source of the stream. And after that, we create a stream. And after that, we can apply one, zero, one, or any number of intermediate operation. And finally, we call a terminal operation, which will result the, we will give our result. So let's uh, go back to the last slide example here, right? We have the stream here, right? The first thing we start with a source and the source in here is the array. So this is the source. The second one, we create a stream with the off function. And then what you see, the next one is an intermediate operation, what is filter. And finally in here, I call a terminal operation, what is the sum. And we have the result after that, okay? Uh, another thing that I want to share with you in here is that usually the source is uh, array or collection. The intermediate operation including filter, sorting or mapping or conversion. And finally, the aggregate, uh, the, the terminal operation usually aggregate the result. For example, we can count, we can sum, and we can result back the, uh, the collection, okay? So this is the stream pipeline. So how we can apply this pipeline to solve our first problem, which is to find the average score of a player. This is the solution. You see that here, right? All of them are function. In the first step, we call the stream, so the stream function so that we can create a stream. After that, in the second step, we call an intermediate function with a filter so that we can get all the elements of the layer of the layer one. And after that, we say that the other we don't care. We only need to get the score. So we map to double, we get all the score. And finally, in the fourth step, we average the score. So this is what I just showed you already, right? The first one, we create a stream. The second one, we filter the element. After that, we get only the score. And finally, we compute the average. The result is still the same. But you see here, we want and we only specify what we want to do and not how we do it. So given that, right, what is the advantages of this uh, functional programming? The first one, you see just now, right? We just declare what we want to do. So it allows us to write more declarative and more concise program. And in relation to that, we can focus on the problem and rather than our coding. So this is a very good one. And the final one, and I think that this one is the most important one, is that if we want to do it to program in parallelism, we want to support the parallelism. This one is much easier than the last one we have. Okay, so uh, with that, this is the end of this uh, functional programming. In my last slide, I will show you the, another example, how we can apply functional programming in the very common task that is to create the leaderboard. So for example, we want to uh, display the top three scorer using the JavaScript. So this is how we want to do that. The first step, right? We have all the lists, right? We have all the elements. So we can source the list. The next one, we retrieve only the top three. And for each of the element, we display the information. So this is the, uh, the implementation using the functional programming. You see that the first function is sorted. The second one is we get the, the top three. So we call the limit. And for each of the element, we display the username, the score, and the day time, okay? So this is the uh, display for the, uh, the program. 
you see that the, all the username over there, the score that they have, and the time that they play. So it's uh, the end for my uh, presentation about this functional programming. The next one is about Android for online gaming by Chewa. Thank you very much. Uh, hello. Good morning. Um, I'm Chewa. Um, so uh, let's take a look at some of the technologies in Android for online gaming. Uh, first, we look at uh, Bluetooth. So Android being a mobile operating system offers a uh, lot of services to applications running on top of it. So one of them uh, is Bluetooth. So a game would use Bluetooth to discover and pair with a game controller. And from there on, the game can receive the gamer's input via the game controller. And likewise, can send tactile feedback to the game controller. For, for example, ask it to vibrate. Authentication. So we are quite familiar with this, whereby uh, we usually provide a username and password uh, to verify our identity. So in Android, uh, could we do it differently? Uh, yes. So we could use a biometric authentication. Uh, biometric authentication relies on a unique biological characteristic of a person. Um, in games, uh, we can use uh, fingerprint identification, which is part of biometric uh, authentication. So we can use it for logging into a game account, or we can use it to purchase weapons in a game. Uh, this is a fun fact. So the fingerprint sensor, which is the hardware, is usually located at the bottom area of the mobile phone or behind the mobile phone. So I'm using a BlackBerry Key One. Uh, it's awesome. Um, it's run Android, and the fingerprint sensor is actually integrated into the space bar of the physical keyboard. Or when I first got it, I was like, "Wow!" So it was so cool. Now, how does uh, Android does fingerprint identification? Um, so it requires the vendors of the fingerprint sensor to do two things. First, to enroll new fingerprints. Secondly, to recognize enrolled fingerprints. Right? So from a software perspective, the game will request from Android to say that I need a fingerprint identification. Right? So invoke the hardware, the fingerprint sensor now listens for a human touch. Next, the vendor's code, which is the software, determines if there's a fingerprint match. And it returns a result to say, yes, there's a match, or no, there's no match to Android, and Android passed that information to the game. Audio capture. In games, we use our voice to communicate with our teammates. The microphone in our mobile device is used to capture sound waves. Uh, we can use Android's media recorder API, which is part of the Android media services to encode our sound waves and send it back to our gaming servers. When our sound waves, when our voice packets reach our teammates, the game can use the media player API uh, to decode and play back the voice packets. Uh, the accelerometer is a motion sensor that's used for measuring acceleration forces. So by sensing the amount of acceleration on the X, Y, Z axis, we can analyze how the mobile device is actually moving. So for example, with reference to the uh, diagram, moving the mobile device towards us will register a positive value on the Z axis. On the right is a piece of uh, Android code that reads values of the accelerometer. So first of all, the first part, we register our intent to receive uh, accelerometer values. The lower part is where Android will call us whenever it detects a, a tilt in our mobile phone. A game like 3D Maze, uh, which is the one on the right, uses the accelerometer for its gameplay. Uh, the ball is stationary when the mobile device is level. Once the mobile device is tilted, the ball accelerates towards the tilt. Gamers sometimes stream their games that they are playing for others to watch. Uh, notice the picture-in-picture -picture mode where the 
uh, player space is superimposed on the game itself. The game can use Android's uh, camera API uh, and capture the uh, gamer's face and send it as a separate video stream uh, back to the game server. Modern mobile devices have very capable graphics processor units, uh, also known as GPUs. A game models, those uh, little characters that are running in the games, they are made up of many small polygons, right? or you can think of them as little triangles. So they are used to create the face, uh, the arm, the body. Now the GPU has to perform shading calculation on each of these polygons to make the shading in the whole game look right. Our Android provides mechanisms for the games to leverage on the GPU, which is like hardware acceleration, right, to render the graphics uh, in the game. Augmented reality is the blending of interactive digital elements into our real world environments. Now the pavement, the man in the pink shirt, and the park cars, they are all real, right? They exist in the real world of the man holding the mobile phone. The yellow character is superimposed on the pavement to make it look like it's part of the real world scene. Now, how do they do that? So the gamer's real world is first captured as video frames uh, from the mobile device camera. Uh, the game then uses some library, uh, uh, Android AR Core uh, is one of them, and to detect for edges. Uh, which is basically straight lines in the video frames. Uh, edges are actually quite important to give the gamer a realistic uh, experience. For example, uh, the falling objects, they are digital uh, with reference to the image. Uh, the green cube, the purple uh, tube, they are all tumbling down the staircase, which is a real world object. And they are bouncing off the edges of the steps. So in order for this to happen, we need to detect the straight lines so that when the digital object intersect with it, we will program it such that the object has a bigger force, right, to bounce off the edge. So the user will feel that, oh, there's real interaction uh, with the real world. All right, so now let's take a look at uh, machine learning for uh, online gaming. We'll look at uh, three topics. Uh, one is cheat detection. Uh, secondly is uh, matchmaking, which is to form groups. Uh, the third one is uh, to make the game AI smarter. Uh, let's look at cheating in uh, Counter-Strike. So Counter-Strike is a first-person shooting game. Uh, some of the hacks are wall hacks. So for example, with this cheat, you can actually see through walls to know where your opponents are. So when they just come out of the wall, you just, just shoot them. The second one is the aim bots. So you will get 100% shooting accuracy without in, needing to aim with your mouse. Uh, the third one is a 3D box hack, right? So it adds a box around your opponent to make them stand up. So it's easier for you to shoot them. The fourth one is a mobility hack. So you get a boost in your movement speed your jumping ability. So it could be jumping so fast, right, that your enemies can't even take a good aim at you. Right, so these are the cheats. Uh, in order to detect them, so we introduce a concept called uh, outlier. Right? So a subject that differs significantly from the others, we call it a outlier. The image shows a data point that is at the far top right, while the rest are at the bottom left. So the data point that is at the far top right is an outlier. So outliers in basketball, Michael Jordan, uh, widely known as the greatest of all time, uh, breaks all kinds of uh, records, world championship, most valuable player, slam dunk champion, you name it, he has done it. Uh, I remember at one time, uh, kids actually wanted two things. Uh, they want to be like Mike, uh, which is Michael Jordan, and they want a pair of uh, Air Nike shoes. Outlier in golf, so Tiger Woods, multiple wins for Masters, PGA, US Open. Uh, even though I don't play golf, I actually know who, my good, uh, who Tiger Woods is. So his popularity transcends 
outside his spot. So let's transform uh, our problem of detecting cheaters into a problem of finding outliers. So one way to detect outliers is to cluster based on the player's performance metrics and flat out those that are significantly better than the rest. So on the left is a scatter plot. Uh, you see a lot of dots, those are the scatter plot. That is the scatter plot. And it shows the performance of Michael Jordan, which is the red dot. It lies outside the norm of NBA players. We can use a similar technique to flat out potential cheaters. So we are not saying that if you play very well, then you are cheat. We are saying that you play so well that we would like to take a closer look. Matchmaking, which is to form groups. So let's look at a game called uh, Capture the Flag. So the goal of the game is for each team to capture the other team's flag and bring it back to its base. Uh, so there are potential problems. If a team consists of mostly of strong players, uh, of weak players, the game ends quickly. Right? This impacts the enjoyment of the game as strong teams do not feel challenged, or uh, weak teams feel dejected. Another game, auto racing. So the goal of the game is to race other drivers around a racetrack. Uh, the first one to cross the finish line wins. A problem with this is if a weak player joins a race that are mostly of strong players, then a weak player will feel outclassed right, and feel demotivated. Strong players even worse, right? They are afraid of the weaker players losing control of their cars and crashing into them. We can use clustering uh, to find balanced teams in the capture the flag uh, game. So for the gaming metrics, we can use uh, the number of kills, number of times being fatally shot, uh, previous times in capturing a uh, flag, and the shot kill ratio. So are you a one shot, one kill player, or are you a 10 shot, one kill player? So with this uh, gaming metrics, we can cluster our players into respective scale groups, like the plot on the left. So the individual points represents our players and the positions on the plot is derived from their gaming metrics. Different colors represents a uh, different skill level. And now to form a team, all we need to do is pick one from each of the cluster. For team two, do the same thing. And now we have two balanced team to pit against each other. K nearest neighbor. Or uh, we can use this to solve uh, finding players of similar skills. Uh, again, we need data, some of the uh, metrics that we can use, uh, speed on the straights or S curves, number of collisions, number of safe overtakes, uh, finish times and positions. Uh, then we generate a plot that looks like this. So again, the position, the, the points uh, represents the players, uh, the color represents skill levels. And now we have a new player that comes along that has only played a couple of games. We place them based on the gaming uh, metrics so far into our data space. And we say K nearest neighbor, where K is a positive integer. So let's say K is seven. We pick the closest seven neighbors uh, around the new player. So we will have five reds and two yellows. So majority wins are uh, the new player will be classified as someone who have a scale of red. We can also use another method uh, to find, uh, to, to determine the scale of a player. So let's look at our neural networks. So neural networks are layers of computing units loosely mimicking how our mind works. So we can train our neural network with performance metrics again. Right, for example, if our game only has three skill levels, we take a set whole bunch of performance metrics that belongs to a low skill player and show that to the neural network. We do the same for medium and high skill players. Right. After that, we take a performance metric of a new player. So we have, the neural network haven't seen this before and we ask it to predict what is the skill level of this player. Finally, we look at uh, game AI. So game AI controls non-human players that exist to make the games more challenging. Right? So for example, if there are only 18 racing cars, 
uh, in the grid and only eight humans, right? Then the remaining 10 cars will be controlled by the game AI. The intelligence of the game AI impacts the gaming experience. For example, a dumb game AI who keep crashing into humans uh, and frustrates them along the way. What can we do about this? We can use reinforcement learning uh, to train our game AI to make a sequence of smart decisions. So how do we do it? So if the game AI make a bad decision like ramming into another car in the grid, we would penalize the action. If we make a good decision like yielding and to an opponent to prevent a crash, we will reward the action. So by iterating this process, we can uh, make our game AI to consistently pick the best action, right? So with that, I would li like to end our talk. Um, I'd like to invite back uh, Surya and Tin for the uh, Q&A. So while we are waiting for questions, I take this opportunity to summarize our work here. What we have tried to showcase is a single use case. We walked you through the various aspects of building it through from starting from conceiving the idea, uh, then talking about aspects of uh, uh, persona mapping, then about uh, reactive tech stack, your options that you can choose from. And then of course, the very popular paradigm, pro programming language paradigm that we use, which is functional programming. And of course, the last part of it included the mobile extensions and the cherry on the ice was the different interesting machine learning algorithms at your disposal to be able to improve your game interaction. Okay. So would you like to add something more to this, Tin Chewa? Are we okay with this? Okay. Yes, okay. So thank you very much for listening. We don't have any questions on the stack as of now, but uh, I would like you to take a look at this curriculum. There is also a QR code that will be displayed on the webinar. So feel free to put in some comments about the talk. And uh, if you'd like to understand the details of the course, please visit our NUS ISS website uh, for the details. So there are a few questions that are coming in. Um, Adeline, for example, is asking us, uh, what, are the course, uh, what are the courses I can learn? The whole thing is being packaged as a PG diploma in systems analysis. We have few modules there. Okay? So um, you can try to visit the website. It talks about the design part, the software engineering aspects that we discuss, the web programming aspects that we discuss, the mobile programming aspects, as well as the machine learning. So all these things are packaged as modules uh, with interesting information available on it. Um, there's a reinforcement learning, so I will let Cherwa answer that. In the meanwhile, I'm going to talk about the main tech stacks that we uh, learn in the course. So you can see that uh, we are now in an era where we can't be very religious about programming language. So this course is a very unique one that showcases all different kind of languages. I'm, I'm very honest. We start with C Sharp. We walk you through the Java stack. We have some JS client extensions. We end it with Python. So you can see that in one shot, you get all the top uh, four programming languages currently used in the industry. Not forgetting to mention, we also strike a balance on the new generation programming styles in terms of functions and functional programming. Um, there's a question that says, uh, is reinforcement learning much better than creative or critical thinking? So um, I, I, I guess I'll, I'll interpret the creative and critical thinking as algorithms. So, um, so it's, it's quite different because uh, algorithms is that we know the solution. Uh, so basically we are saying that you should move left, move right. Uh, whenever you see this thing, you should do this. All right, but uh, in the real world, there are situations where there are, there are too many possibilities to, to do that. So reinforcement learning is a slightly uh, different approach. It's more of letting the software learn by itself by saying that, or oh, if you did, so basically it's like you do something first, we tell the software. So the software make a, a certain action. Then we say, oh, the re reward 
is this. Negative reward means penalized. Positive reward means good. Do that more often. Uh, so based on this, the program is going to deduce what is the right step that I need to do. So instead of the uh, programmer having to uh, dictate every single step for it. So there is another question on functional programming. On the functional programming part, it seems like functions and methods in modern programming like Python. Okay, so uh, as I uh, shared before, right, the functional programming style is a style of programming only, and it's getting more and more popular. So before that, not many uh, programming supported, but now more and more. Uh, besides the Java one that I've discussed, I'm sure that there's a JavaScript and C Sharp also uh, implemented. And it seems that uh, Python, if it's implemented, is very normal. So it's a different way, a different way, a different style that you can think and then you can do programming. And just to add on a lighter note, um, I found it very interesting that you call Python modern language. So Python is an age-old language that started with procedural language, and I'm very impressed the way that it has evolved. So I think uh, Python is a representative of ISS, you know, always evolving and always on the top, just like our always learning and always leading. That's brilliant, right? Yes. Yeah. And uh, we have a pack of new languages like Julia, Go, uh, Scala, Kotlin. Okay. But uh, please understand, when we discuss tech stacks, we are not trying to sell you into one camp. We are trying to teach you the paradigm behind, the principles behind, and we are sort of trying to teach you to fish. We hope you can sail the ocean and sky is the limit. Okay. Uh, there's one more question. Which is better object-oriented or functional programming and which has better performance? So as I said, these two are designed at different points on time. Object-oriented programming has been around for 30 plus years and functional programming is a new style. Okay? So it is like trying to compare apple and oranges. Their purpose is different. Their performance is different. The thinking and the computing paradigms that go, go behind them is different. So yeah, so um, you don't compare your parent with yourself. That's not a good benchmark. You compare yourself with yourself. Your yesterday and today, right? So you know, to be very fair, functional programmings are supposed to be treated together. OPs are to be treated differently. That's a nice question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.